introduced today's speaker, Jonathan Taylor from Stanford University. Jonathan, like one of the most leading experts on multiple fields. If you're working on something like geometry data analysis, topological data analysis, stochastic geometry, and multiple testing and selective inference, you must have read a lot of paper, right? <laughs> from Jonathan, it's all very insightful and very exciting. And today he's going to talk about very fun topics on the rendered field beyond the neural. And that's thanks. Thank you, Yanchi. Thanks for thank you for the invitation. Yeah. I I've been telling a few people today that this is only my second talk since 2020. I really didn't do any Zoom talk, uh, so this has been an opportunity for me to, to try and finish a project before coming to give the talk. And so I've been, this is relatively fresh stuff. I haven't put anything up on the archive yet um, and haven't finished implementing everything, but nevertheless, I hope to, to tell you a little bit about it. So this, this talk um, has random fields in it. Uh, and it's going to have some selective inference in it. And this sort of closes the loop on some of uh, my work uh, from the last decade to the previous decades. So as a graduate student, I studied random fields under the null hypothesis, like signal detection, scan statistics. And in the last 10 years or so, I've been interested in sort of not under the null, like confidence intervals in when you use the data to select the model. So this, this talk is trying to kind of close the loop. I've always said there's a lot of connections between the two, but it's taken me a while to kind of write down some of the connections. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with like a, a little table from this old paper. This, this paper, Worsley and Friston, is sort of one of the early papers on modeling fMRI that describes a, a linear model to model fMRI. And uh, I've just extracted a little table here. This is a sort of, you know, I'll give a two slide description on fMRI in a second, but this is the kind of table I want to talk about today, um, where we have uh, some peaks. Let me first go to a picture, let's say. This is a picture of the brain. We've run, there's been an fMRI analysis. This is an example from the NILEARN uh, package that for modeling fMRI. And there's some sort of peaks that have been highlighted here as being uh, le P less than 0.05 corrected. And they're labeled here in the image. And sometimes they'll get kind of extracted into this table and there'll be a summary here, right? Like um, uh, there's some P value here, P, Z, max greater than U. We have a number of different peaks and we have a P value reported for each peak, right? And, you know, one of the questions, uh, you know, of interest usually is, you know, you'd like to know something about, we see, we've declared a peak at minus 14, minus 70, 20. Uh, that happened to be the largest Z score and maybe we'd like to answer the question, is there really a peak at that location or how high is the peak at that location? Can I build a confidence interval for the height of the peak at that location? And that's the kind of thing I wanna talk about. Uh, so these tables here, you can think of them as all testing sort of marginal associations. There's no really notion of peaks or you know, relationship between peaks. And I wanna try and talk about that as well today. Here's another peak at 24, minus 24 minus 836, who is also pretty high. Um, you know, are these two things related? Like if I allow for the effect of this region, maybe this is in the auditory cortex, is there still a visual effect? Um, or is this just capturing a marginal association through the auditory cortex or something like that? I wanna enable researchers to build models and answer questions and maybe, you know, quantify the height of these peaks. Okay, so here's a one slide, not even a dense slide model of fMRI. This is a sort of, massively univariate analysis where we think of Y is gonna be my fMRI data. I'll have E for epoch time and T for is what I use for space, but I could have used an S, but I use T everywhere else. So T here is space. So we have some, there's some model of the experiment. This is what the uh, experimental manipulates. We model it as a time series. We might record some other confounding variables we wanna regress out. And each, you know, each column in the design matrix there's a spatial effect, and then there's some measurement noise or otherwise unexplained variation. We're going to fit a least squares model, uh, and then we're going to get out of it for every contrast in the, you know, every column of um, X, there's going to be a, a beta hat image. Uh, and we can, I guess I should have made, this is maybe, should have made a contrast, like I'll take the first coordinate of beta hat E divided by its standard error, and I get a map of Z statistics, or if I, you know, I didn't have a high degree of freedom, maybe I call them T statistics. Uh, but this is this Z here is, you know, this Z that they're talking about here. And 
they give the score here for the probability the maximum is above you. And of course, this should really have a little zero here for the probability under the null, the maximum is above the level u. Okay, so I want to, as I said, I want to try and model something about these peaks jointly and maybe be able to compare the heights of peaks and maybe even give some uncertainty about where the peaks occur. Is it actually at whatever, minus 14, minus 70, 20, or how much variation is in it? But I'm going to start today really just talk about a, a one dimensional example. Um, a, that's the only thing I've implemented before, but also like it's really, it's easy to, to see everything in one dimension. It's kind of hard, hard to visualize things in three dimensions, even though we can make three dimensional plots, but I find it hard to actually reason about them. Like you can spin them around and is everything going to be concrete in one dimension today? Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, a way to select peaks that's going to use something like the lasso. So it's going to select here. I've, this, this black curve here is my up observed signal plus noise. And I'm going to select peaks. There's these, these are these, these gray dots. These are the sort of locations of the peaks. I put, in, put the value at two. This is the, the sort of th the lambda parameter in the lasso. And uh, I've, I've put these, these gray dots up here at two for a particular reason, and I'll get to it later. Uh, so what I'm going to do actually, is I'm going to take my F, and if I wanted to say something about peak location, I'm actually going to do a variant of data splitting. So what I'm going to do is add a bit of noise to F. That's going to be F superscript F. That's my, the data I use for selection. And this U here, these dots here are the, um, uh, you know, the selected peaks. And the fact that they're at plus two and a bit rather than minus two and a bit is because they were selected with positive signs instead of negative signs. Okay. And one thing that I will probably not have time to get to everything, but one thing we're going to talk, we'll see later is this U process, this gray thing here. Um, it's going to help me understand how the lasso picks out its peaks. There are different ways you could pick out peaks. Uh, for instance, if we go back to this table, you know, this was, these were probably extracted using some like simple peak detection algorithm on a grid. And here I picked out the top two peaks. Uh, that is one way to build a model with two peaks, take the top two, but it's something I can't really control as well. So I can't really understand as well. So I'm gonna use the lasso because I understand how the lasso selects peaks. Uh, and then I'm gonna build confidence intervals for effects in a model based on these peaks and maybe for confidence regions for the location of these peaks. And the tool I'm gonna use for that is a palm process. And to do inference, I'm gonna put an exponential family on top of the palm process. Okay, so what is the palm process? For those of you who don't know that term or in the context of zeros of a Gaussian field, it's sometimes called a Slepian model. Uh, it's a model that if you have a smooth process, it sort of conditions the process to have something happen at a particular point. Um, so if we look at this U process, uh, one thing you can see is that it touches just, this is just a little over two. It touches exactly at that value at this peak and this peak. And so there are local maxima for this process at these peaks. So what I'm gonna effectively do is condition my data so that this U process has local maxima at the assigned peak location. So that's where the, the palm process is gonna come into. So palm distribution is not something we see every day. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. Uh, and then the exponential family part, that should be pretty straightforward. One unfortunate thing is that I don't really know how to normalize this exponential family very well, but there's an approximate likelihood that we can use, and that's what I'll finally use to construct the intervals. And I would say the, the likelihood method works unreasonably well. Uh, I don't really understand why it seems to work as well as it does. Okay. Okay, so back to, let me say a little bit about these palm models and where they come from. So a natural thing to do with this, with this image of Z statistics, you might test the null hypothesis using a scan statistic, like the largest, the largest Z score, major, maybe the largest Z score in absolute value. And you, know, you can control the family wise error rate. If you can work out the distribution of the largest Z, say find some level U alpha, so that the probability under the null, the largest Z is above U alpha. So this is how those P values were computed on the first slide with some approximation for this distribution. And then there's observed peak heights, and we're, they're just going to throw those peak heights into an approximation for this probability. And if it's less than, or if, if the peak height is greater than u alpha, 
will reject the error and otherwise we won't. So instead of just a test, maybe we, we could model beta. Like if we, we, we don't think it's the pure null, maybe we can depart from the, the pure null. And I'm gonna sort of do a departure in a, we're gonna be close to the null, but some sort of sparse or low dimensional model close to the null. And that's gonna be the model that has a few peaks at a few different locations, it's gonna be few parameters in the model. Uh, so it's gonna be relatively close to the null. Okay, so this is my running example. Uh, and here I've shown you for, for this example, the 0.05 threshold worked out to be about 2.9. So here I would detect uh, one peak uh, uh, height a little bit above four. And I'll tell you what I would use to report a p value in just a second. Whoops, wrong way here. But okay, so this isn't, this isn't the brain. It's a very simple, small example, but um, I think it's kind of useful for, for at least for my purpose today. So one thing about it is it's, we're not looking at a growing box. You know, I have an interval here, minus 10 to 10. I'm not thinking about growing the interval. So it's a fixed domain kind of asymptotics. If I look at large box, then the, uh, here I put high dimensional, I should have said extreme value. In the large box limit, think there's a lot of theory about extreme values that kick in for Gaussian processes. So where, and I'm explicitly not doing that. I want a fixed box and, and not even high, high threshold. But anyways, it's a fixed domain. And it's a complicated enough process that, you know, we can't really pick out the, the, the peaks by eye. It looks like there's at least one peak. Um, and it's not, it's not exactly null. I'll show you the true signal in this, in this problem in just a second. But my point is that if we're going to apply this to the brain, there's going to probably be a lot of reasons where it looks like the null. So I want to understand at least some, you know, small departures from the null. How do they behave and can I model them reasonably well? So that's why I picked a sort of simple example like this. So how many peaks do you think this one has? Any guesses? Two. Okay. It's a good guess. Yes, there are two peaks. And actually, you know, but look by eye, yeah, those are pretty good estimates of the two peaks. But of course, we we don't know that a priori. We have to find them, right? And that's the point of uh, the selection for peak selection. Okay. Uh, so I've kind of phrased the problem in terms of looking for peaks in fMRI data, but this is kind of a generic problem. Like you can think of this, I'm hunting for bumps where I have uh, under my null, I have a Gaussian process with mean zero and some uh, covariance function or some otherwise say to what some reproducing kernel space H. And you know, the not, if, you, if I have reproducing kernel space H, which is basically the same as knowing the covariance function, there's a kind of natural models for the mean of such things. Uh, oh, I, I sort of used the wrong note. Well, actually, no, I didn't use the wrong notation. Sorry, I'm talking to myself. So what, what is my model here? I'm gonna take some set of bumps. Uh, those are functions in the reproducing space. And I'm gonna model my mean as a linear combination of those bumps. So the canonical choice for these, the shape of these bumps is to take the covariance kernel tied down at a particular observation, right? And that's the same thing. If you do a kernelized regression, you know that the solution can always be expressed as a linear combination of the covariance kernel tied down at your observed x's. Those are the canonical bumps. But you might be in a situation like here, I might have thrown in a really big peak, and then well, no one single bump, like the act, this is a Gaussian kernel covariance with bandwidth one. If the true signal was bandwidth five, well, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't be looking for bumps of bandwidth one. I should be looking for bumps of bandwidth one fifth or five, depending if which is smoother or rougher, however we call it. So if I were looking for smoother functions, I would take, instead of just the kernel died down at some points, I would take smooth versions of those. But I, I could still take those as my, my bumps and I'll look for appearances of those bumps at different places. So one common, one thing people do in these sort of signal detection problems is they do scale space. So in, if you have a Gaussian kernel with some given bandwidth, they'll look at that fixed bandwidth and also a range of smoother bandwidths where you think there might be some signal that is not just uh, the smallest possible bandwidth. And why are these sort of natural uh, models to use? Well, it turns out um, if I take a, a mean function in the reproducing kernel space, then I have a likelihood ratio between that and the null. So I can sort of you know, and the likelihood ratio is, it tells me that the, 
the collection of distributions is an exponential family. And it's I have here, it's proportional to e to the z inner product with mu. And there's some ambiguity about what I mean here by z inner product with mu. Mu is a, is a vector in the reproducing space and z is a path of the process. The path of the process is almost surely not in the reproducing space. So this inner product is kind of poorly poorly defined, but it's it's possible to define, and it's called the 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 Paley Wiener integral. And maybe I'll just write it. As, you know, what is it? Uh, if I take my if I take my my function h to be a linear combination, uh, let's say i of weights a i, and take the kernel at the knots t i, then this integral. No one can read this. This integral, it's so it's going to take the same linear comp with the same weights, but instead of k of ti, it's going to take the process z at ti. So you can define that for any linear combination, basic linear combination of the kernel tied down to the bumps, and you can extend it to any function in H by you know taking limits if you need. So I have a likelihood ratio. And this is going to be the basis for my exponential family. And you know, looking ahead in a little bit, I'm going to talk about the palm process. And that's, as I said, some way of conditioning a process. Um, so I'm going to sort of look at when I condition the null process, I'm going to also create a whole other family of distributions that look that are the conditioned P mu processes. And because I have a likelihood ratio for the unconditional distributions. When I condition on them, I'm going to have a likelihood ratio with the same sufficient statistic and natural parameter. So that's going to be the basis for the model we use uh, for inference. Any questions so far? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to. Um, okay. So as I said, I'm going to try and describe the selection and try and describe how we do inference. So. I set my threshold. So about on average, if there was no signal, I would have about you know, half, well, on average, half peaks, 1.5 peaks would show up at this threshold, whatever that means. It's not a chance 50% to getting one, but on average, there would be half gray dots in expectation under the null. Okay, now for my data, which was, I ran this algorithm on the, the selection process, the red one, it selected these two peaks. Now, I can try and answer the question, is the left peak higher than the right peak? And of course, we shouldn't be looking at the red curve and the black curve before we ask that question, uh, because, well, you know, we're much more likely to ask the question, is the left bigger than the right than the right bigger than the left, just because that's what the data tells us. But what you can't, you can't ask this question if I just tell you the, where these dots occur. So I'm going to tell you, I put a peak at, let's see, this is around minus two, and this one's around plus two. I put a peak at minus two and a peak at plus two. They were positive. Now, how does that help you form a hypothesis that you might like to test? Uh, so you'll be able to look at the peaks before you set your hypothesis. Okay, and at the end of this, we're gonna have a little table, just like a summary table you would get from linear regression. So this is uh, where we have point estimates for the peak heights. Uh, some standard deviation for the estimated peak heights. And we have p values testing whether the peak height is zero or not. And the peak around minus two is, you know, has a very small p value. The one on the right was a little lower, is a little less evidence. And we also have confidence intervals for this, this peak height, and they actually kind of cover it in some sense. We can also ask the question, and I'm going to try and explain how we do this, but just to sort of, this is where we hope to get to compare the left to right. So here I did a one sided test comparing the, the height of the at location, this one minus the height of that one. Not a lot of evidence that um, the left one is bigger than the right one. Okay. Uh, so this method I'm gonna describe is an example of what we've called data carving. That is something that's sort of in the simplest setting is kind of something between data splitting and, um, and this naive method that ignores Collection. So I'm going to show you, here's some plots here of um, what I'll call, uh, well, p-values under a few different scenarios. The null hypothesis, I've just removed those peaks in the picture I showed you. And the alternative, it's the same, it's always the same 
the same uh, distribution as the picture I showed you. We can see that the, uh, the, the naive p-values, well, they're clearly not p-values because under the null, they, they just don't look like if I threshold them at 5%, I'm gonna have like 90% type one error. So the naive method doesn't work under the null. Uh, under the alternative na naive method has a, you know, it's pretty high, that's good, um, has power. Uh, okay, compared to these other two data splitting, and I'll describe by what I mean data splitting in a second, and this data carving, they look like p-values. They're not perfectly underlying, um, but uh, they're pretty close. Uh, so if I threshold these at 5%, I'm gonna get about 5% type one error. And they have power in the alternative. Um, and this data carving is uh, has more power than data splitting. And I'm gonna try and describe how to construct this data carving uh, intervals and tests as we go. Okay, so this, uh, data carving is somehow in between data splitting and naive. And the, the idea is that when there's really a lot of selection pressure, this data carving method kind of reverts to data splitting. So data splitting is kind of often valid. Um, I mean, if you get have the, the variance correct, you can often use data splitting. And, uh, and this data carving will kind of look like data splitting when, when you've happened to choose something that where there's a lot of selection pressure um, or like selection effect. And when there's no selection effect, this um, data carving kind of starts to revert to the naive method. Uh, but data splitting never reverts to the naive method. So you can really see this in confidence intervals. Um, so here's a, a summary. I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but let's focus on the, the length of the confidence intervals. So I'm the data splitting I've done here is sort of I'm using 80% of the data for selection, 20% for inference. So I have five times less data in data splitting than I do uh, for the naive model. So I'd expect the confidence interval for data splitting to be about square root of five longer than the naive one. And if you look at the ratio, this 8.8 .8 divided by 3.9 is about square root of five. So that's the price um, data splitting pays. This data carving one, note it actually can be significantly less than the 8.9. So you can recover some of the selection effect. And that's because when it was an easy, easy problem with very little selection effect, this data carving method essentially collapses to the naive one. So you can improve on data splitting by, um, by data carving. And we're actually, the selections and the data given to the two algorithms are identical. So this, the set of peaks we test each time for data splitting and data carving are identical. We just have shorter confidence intervals and higher power. Question. Right, so this selection you're referring to is the first selecting the peak based on the threshold and then assigning the significance or the value. Well, the selection is only the peaks, and then now I'm now I'm building it. Now I'm assuming, but let's see. Yes, yeah, so with these two, there's a sort of a two peak model. Like if I if my base kernel is the actual covariance kernel at the knots, then I'm gonna build a regression model that has you know a kernel function tied down here and a kernel function tied down here. And I'm gonna put two parameters in front of it. And I'm trying to test whether the parameters are zero and I'm trying to construct confidence for those parameters. Yes, another question? It could be, but it could be the, I mean, it's possible that uh, we're, it's possible that this would actually go down as far as that. So I think in the next one, I, I, have, a, I have a slide later where I doubled the height of the peaks and the length of these intervals for the carving are, are four, at the same as the, the data splitting one. And these ones are always the same as they were at the 80-20 split. 50-50, you're right, these would, be, these would be shorter. But on the other hand, I'd have a poor selection. Right. If you look at, I added some noise to my process, but it's actually pretty close, and the peaks are quite close. But if I had added fifty percent noise, that's possible. You know, the peaks in the red would be very different from the peaks in the in the black. So there's some trade-off, and I don't know where to put the trade-off on, like eighty twenty or fifty fifty. But I think you know, eighty percent of your data, if if you can't, if eighty percent of the data doesn't identify at least some of the interesting features in your data set, then you know. Then they're very. You're a very hard boundary. Like you somehow picked a sample size where it's you know really hard to find anything. And you, we could construct problems like that, but I don't know if that's the generic problem. But I think eighty percent is is a lot of the data. Yes. 
to like specify the location of the knot. Um, no. over, over here, it's going to be like your search and over into the space of all possible locations. I am, yeah, and I am, yeah. So you are, yeah. Okay. So the uh, lasso so told you, me where they were. Yes, I haven't told you. Uh, that. Okay, so you, like you're doing a continuous state search over all possible. Yeah, in the computer is discrete, but yes, in theory it's continuous. Yes. Be discrete by this. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, if, if I could solve the problem in continuous space, I would. Uh, but and the solution I'm building is something that would that that is the, you know. That takes into account the continuous space, but mm -hmm. on a computer, I can't do the continuous space. There are some examples of this, like the group lasso, for example, is an is an example of the same selection procedure. And there, you it is a, there is a continuous search, but it search search over a circle, and you can do the optimization exactly for that one. But yeah, the lasso pick these two out. I haven't exactly told you what the lasso I'm using is yet. Yeah, and I see I, I I'm not going to get through everything, but so I'm glad I put some of the the summary in the beginning. Okay, um, and I should also say that you know I don't have to pick the model that has you know the lasso pick these these two points. I don't have to say I'm only going to use this two peak model given by the lasso. I could show my neuroscientist colleagues this algorithm pick these two peaks. Now, what kind of what do you think are interesting questions? Do you want to test for a difference between the left and the right hemisphere, or they can specify the regression model, but they're only given the location of the peaks and whether there was a, a maxima or a minimum. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me try. Oh, I, I was also going to say we're also going to get sort of confidence regions for peak locations. And uh, this is a sort of a graphic example of what you might see. Uh, the sort of pinkish dots here are in the actual locations chosen by the lasso. And I've constructed a confidence region for a peak. Um, and these stars are where the true peaks are here. So it turns out, you know, sometimes these regions, these confidence intervals are going to be infinite. Um, and there's that sort of unavoidable. Um, sometimes they're not. And in this case, it's close to a true peak. If I double the signal size as I did here, the peaks get smaller. So the width of the, the intervals for the peak location get smaller. The width of these things is sort of inversely proportional to where the confidence region is. So if the confidence region moves away, they get smaller. And um, yes. Okay. Okay, so let me try and say something about how we construct this. Uh, the main tool used to compute these probabilities and for this palm process is this Katz Rice formula. It's a formula that you can use to count um, the number of local maxima of a smooth process or the number of zeros of a smooth, of a vector valued process. It's a kind of one of the only, one of the most common tools we have for looking at special points of Gaussian processes. So let me just leave it as that. So. We have, um, so I'm gonna start using F for my Gaussian field because I like F instead of Z in general, but so this was gonna replace what Z was before. So the way people compute these approximate um, tail probabilities is using this like, heuristic that I don't wanna get into too deeply called the expected Euler characteristic heuristic. Um, and let's just say what it is. It's, uh, it's an integral over the search region of some expected Jacobian, you know, I'm counting threshold peaks above the level U, and this gradient here says I'm at a critical point, and there's a few other boundary terms. I don't want to really get, I really don't want to dwell on this, except that this determinant shows up in the, in the palm distributions in just a little bit. So a little bit of notation. If I, if I have a Gaussian process F, and it's differentiable, I can talk about its gradient at T, and I can, you know, I can condition the Gaussian process to have a gradient zero at T. Right? And that's another Gaussian process. I've just changed the covariance uh, and I've changed the mean. And uh, at first pass, this would seem to be, this, this is the right distribution you should use to condition, a, like at a particular T, condition the Gaussian process to have a critical point at, at um, T. Um, so I'm gonna call that process this zero is the, we're under the, the, we started with a mean zero, but we've conditioned on the gradient being zero in the Gaussian sense at T. So this is one of the building blocks of the palm process, but there's an additional term related to this determinant. Okay. And so let me, and, and well, okay. So in this case, you can, the 2.9 is the, is the, is a 5% threshold for feminized error rate. Let's just move on. 
what can you do with that? Well, one thing you could do with the, besides just thresholding for peaks, you can also construct simultaneous confidence regions for the mean by adding plus or minus 2.9 to my observed F. And these are the confidence bands and they have some information. They don't really allow me to contrast between peaks. So they don't really, add, they don't really satisfy what I want here. I want to be able to talk about a peak here and a peak there. Is there a difference between these peaks? If I was in a, more of an estimation setting where there's a clear signal, then I think the confidence bands are sort of more informative because you, you know, the signal is sort of screaming out at you. This is kind of a weak signal. So that's explicitly, um, you know, I, I did that explicitly here. Okay, so what is this palm distribution? Um, so I'm gonna use Q for this palm distribution and P for the Gaussian distribution. So this, remember this P zero T naught, this is the Gaussian distribution where I've changed the covariance to condition on the gradient being zero at T naught. And the palm distribution is absolutely continuous and it has this, you know, up to normalization as the, the, the right on Nicodem derivative of the palm distribution relative to the null. And one, one simple reason I can tell you why you, you obviously need something like, you can't just use this as the conditional distribution of the value at T naught condition on having a critical point at T naught is because, well, marginally, if you're in a stationary case, let's say marginally at T naught, the value is independent of the gradient. So just conditioning the, in a Gaussian sense, the gradient to be zero doesn't change the distribution of the value, but clearly, at a local maxima, you know, the marginal distribution of the value there is going to be different than Gaussian because it's higher than all its neighbors. It just has to be somewhat different. And this sort of, uh, this factor here can be used to explain, to model the difference. And it's a um, relatively accurate factor, uh, accurate approximation. Okay. So now um, one thing that people have done to use, look to, have done in the literature is they've given sort of peak specific p values by looking at some sort of let's say selecting all peaks above the level z um, and then looking at the sort of overshoot distribution above the peak using these Slepian models um, and that's another p value that people report in fMRI literature what I want to do essentially is build a Slepian model like this but for the u process that I showed you at the beginning and the u process it doesn't have I'm not looking at a single critical point I want to put critical points at all the places of the, la the lasso selected peaks. But this is basically what uh, a palm distribution for a critical point looks like. And here's a, a picture of what the density looks like for, um, for the random field I'm looking at. So the, the dashed line is the normal zero one density. And this is the distribution of the value at a local maxima for the, the, the particular smoothness. Um, of the process that, that, that I looked at. So you can see it's shifted to the right a little bit because, well, at a local maxima, the value is just going to be a little bit higher than just normal zero one because it's higher than all its neighbors. Okay. So, well, as I said, the uh, without any conditioning, I have an exponential family for if I want to change the mean. And this Lefkin model, it's formally derived by conditioning a P mu model, or uh, so I can, that exponential family structure transfers naturally over to the Slepian model. So now I can talk about a model for a given mean function conditioned on having a critical point at T naught. And with this, you can do things like at a single peak, you can test whether the peak height is any particular value. And so you can use this if you want to get a, a confidence interval for the, the height at a, at a given peak. But as I said, I want to have multiple peaks. Okay, All right, so we want to answer questions like, you know, can I compare these two peaks? If I have a peak over here, is there a corresponding peak in the left hemisphere? Should I add that to my model, et cetera? And maybe something about how variable the peak or some notion of uncertainty for the location of the peak. Okay, so I'm gonna try and hurry up a little bit. So there's a few different models you could consider for the mean. One, make no assumption about the mean, just that it's in the reproducing space. We, a, a natural single peak model is this one, and here's the multi-peak model that I described before. For a given set of peaks, you take the covariance kernel K, type down at those, not, at those locations, and put a, a coefficient in front. And then now, 
this model is parameterized by the beta j, and you can test whether any of the betas are zero. You can maybe do a linear contrast to the betas to compare peaks, etc. Okay, so there's the single peak model is something that's shown up a lot in the in the, in the brain imaging literature, and um, yeah, so here are some of the sort of main uh, contributors to that. I, I want to go to the multi-peak model. And I also want to I, I want to say something else about this, this model I chose. A lot of sort of the results in this analyzed single peak, but having many single peaks, all the, there's some formal results about false discovery rate control in a big box, et cetera. And one of the things they often do is they explicitly assume that um, you know, the signals, whatever they are, aren't overlapping. And that's sort of part of their, you know, part of their assumptions. Uh, so they assume those possibilities away. But here, I mean, I have two peaks, they're overlapped. I can't really, I want to, I don't want to have to make this assumption. So um, I'm not assuming this away. And that's because I'm going to allow these peaks to be close to each other. Okay. So let's go on to formally define my data splitting. So I only actually had one path. It's not obviously clear how one could do data splitting, but um, well, an easy, one way, an analog of data splitting that has a similar 80, this proportion aspect to it is take my original F and then add to it uh, some multiple of an independent draw of F, but under the null. Like, so it, this omega has zero mean. We don't know if F has zero mean or not. So we're gonna make, use, make this process F superscript F for selection. I'm gonna run the lasso on this. And then if I want, I could do, you know, whatever the lasso selects, I could construct confidence intervals using the, re the, the remaining uh, inference data. And why do I call this data splitting? Well, it's easy to check that the, as processes, these things are independent and it has the same, you know, the right variance, like this has variance. If I had 20% left of my data, this has five times more variance than, um, than I began with. So this is just sort of a, a simple, way to do data splitting if you have Gaussian data. Was there a question or? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so here's the, the, the selection process that I showed you before, and here's the, the, the remain, the inference process, the one that has 20% of, um, of the data. And you can see actually this one that uses the 20%, it actually kind of misses this peak. So, uh, this, this is going to be, give me a poor job of estimating, you know, the significance of, is, of this piece, but it has the right distribution and it has the right coverage properties. It's just, it, it um, has less information about the mean in it. So it's has less power to tell whether the mean is zero or not. Okay. So I'm running a bit out of time, um, but I wanted to at least describe the, the model that allows me to do peak location and try and describe the lasso model. Okay, so rather than putting a peak exactly at some location T naught, what if I allow some perturbation delta from T naught? I still have the height beta, so I'm gonna assume my, my mean is some, is, is the kernel tied down near T naught and has some height. And I'll just use a Taylor series expansion uh, so this is a model for a single peak. It actually has the peak tied down at T naught and the gradient of the peak tied down at T naught. And if we do multiple peaks, well, you know, I just have the gradient down, tied down at different knots and the kernel tied down at, at more knots. Okay, so if this is our model, we can, what we're going to do is effectively try and estimate the, the heights, beta J, and here we have the product beta and delta, so I'll call that zeta. We're going to estimate beta and zeta. And if I have some approximate likelihood that works reasonably well, I can get confidence interval for beta, confidence region for zeta. And from that, I can get a, back out a confidence interval for delta. And when you try and do work out what this confidence interval for delta is, you're going to see if your confidence interval for beta doesn't, oh, sorry, contains zero, then after, you know, the inter, this confidence region has to be everything. And that's reasonable, right? If you, you had, you had a peak that doesn't seem significant. It's reasonable to say it could be anywhere. So I don't think it's a, I think, I don't think it's a bug. It's more of a feature here. Okay. Um, so here I've done this, I've constructed these peaks for a simple data splitting example. I'm just going to move on. Uh, 
Okay. So now we know what to do for a single peak. I can use that Slapian model. And what, now what if I want to use two peaks? Um, well, if I fix just, just two peaks, I could relatively easily tell you what the, um, what the appropriate Slapian model is for putting a local maxima at two locations. There's just going to be a Jacobian at location one times a Jacobian at location two, mo modifying the Gaussian process that has um, that has gradient zero at those two locations. Um, so that's for two fixed peaks. But how you choose the peaks matters a little bit. So if my the, the two peaks I, I said I was interested in from that table before, they happen to be the two peaks with the highest scores in my table. And so should, should we be worried about, can I just use the, the Slepian model right out of the box for that? And I would say, be careful, where, warn you about that, because you can actually, instead of just looking for a, a local maxima at some location T naught, you could ask like, what's the, can you do this palm theory for the global maximizer at a particular pot, spot? And you can, and you can write out what, uh, you know, how you should modify the Gaussian process that has gradient zero at T naught. Uh, to describe the distribution of the process condition and have an arg max at some location. And it has this term in here. This term is sort of in common from the previous palm distribution, but there's some indicator here that essentially asserts that T naught is the global max. So for the global max, the, the Slepian theory is different than just a um, local max. And so the, looking at the top two scores, you know, there's probably there's some alternative thing that, that should uh, probably be inserted here. And I don't really want to have to work out what is this, what does this look like for two scores or three scores, four scores. I want something sort of tractable. And that's why I'm going to use the lasso. Okay, so what is the lasso that I'm going to use? Okay, so uh, if I have a, a set of bumps M, I'll put a finite sign measure on M and I'm going to define a new function K gamma uh, is going to be a function that basically integrates the kernel, uh, putting weights at the different locations according to gamma, weights and heights at different locations according to gamma, and gives me a function on M. So this is, you know, uh, this over here is an example of this when I have a discrete measure with weights AI at the dots TI. So that's all I'm doing here. But you could define this for arbitrary measure. And now what's the, um, what, what, what we're, we're going to do? I mean, we could try uh, doing likelihood ratio over a collection of gammas, right? Because we know what the, for a mean gate K gamma, we know what the, um, without, without penal, we know what the likelihood ratio is nominally without selection. It's actually, this is the term, uh, I didn't normalize, but this is the normalization constant for the Gaussian. Uh, my radon nicotine materials before, but this is the sort of likelihood ratio of K gamma versus um, the null. So I have a likelihood term for gamma, and I'm going to put a penalty term for gamma, and it's going to be lambda times the total mass of the, the finite sign measure. And this is a problem, like this optimization problem has various variants throughout the optimization literature, so I'm not claiming that this is necessarily a, a new thing, but um, what I'm talking about is sort of inference for this problem and, and the Slepian model for this problem. Okay. And it includes, you know, the lasso. Well, the la what is the lasso case? Uh, M is just, you know, a finite discrete set. And uh, this, well, uh, group lasso, M would be a disjoint union of spheres um, and various other problems. But we could also do it in this context uh, as well. Okay. So now what, you might ask, why am I going to use the lasso? Um, and it's not just because um, I, you know, I've been at Stanford a long time. That's not the only reason. <laughs> um, okay, so there are lots of different ways you could select, you know, interesting features in regression. We all know that. Uh, and if I want to do this kind of conditional inference to correct for how I select, I can do the correction in, in for lots of different methods. Like if I take the if I had a discrete set of features and I took the top K marginal correlations, I know how to do this correction for selection for the top K marginal. If I ran Benjamin e. Hochberg on the on the z-scores in a discrete sense, I know how to do this conditioning. Um, the problem is 
even for like top two, I don't really know how to do that for the for the field setting. So like, you know, the the event that the two highest peaks were at two locations is actually difficult to describe, right? I have to, you know, there's a critical point here. It's higher than any other critical point. It's higher than any other point. And there's another critical point somewhere else that's higher than any other critical point. And that's kind of not a very nice event to describe. But the lasso selection algorithm is actually pretty simple to describe. And I had that picture before of this process U that allows me to describe uh, the lasso selection. So that's why I'm using the lasso, not because I think it's all necessarily the only or the best way to do things. Okay, so in this problem, you know, under, you know, in pretty wide generality, and I, and I don't know in the optimization literature how much this is explored for random inputs, but these are generally going to be atomic solutions. So it's going to put down a finite set of points and I'll at different locations here. When I solve this problem on a grid, this, this grid has 500 points. Um, it selected these two. Um, and, uh, and I can describe how these points were selected. And it's basically in this picture here. Um, well, let me just move. Here's a slide about characterizing when the lasso chooses a set of points. It chooses a set of points um, if, um, I don't wanna, there's a, I don't wanna dump a bunch of notation on you at 10 minutes left, but it, 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 it selects one thing for the, the active constraints of the KKT says that, you know, if I just did linear regression with this selected set of features, but shrunken down a little bit based on Lambda, I would still have the same sign. So that's this active set condition. And the other condition is that um, this subgradient uh, is pointwise less than or equal to lambda, and you can define the the subgradient as a you know as a process. Uh, if you tell me the set of points, I can tell you the and what lambda is. I can tell you the distribution of the process U. And Right. What does the process you have to satisfy? It has to satisfy pointwise is between minus lambda and lambda. And at these locations, it achieves the value lambda. If I had a negative sign, it would achieve the value negative lambda. So there's a, a local maxima at these different locations. So if I just look at the set of local maxima uh, of this process U, and I insist that, that for if these are my two points, I insist I have two local maxima, and everywhere else I'm less than or equal to lambda then that will tell me that these two points um, satisfy the inactive constraints of the lasso. The other ones are, you know, have to do with the value of the field at, at, at lambda. Okay, so, so you can actually write out the catch rice formula for, you know, what it means, you know, if we're in the generic situation where every pair of points or every three tuple or every four tuple of points could be a solution to the lasso, then you can write out, um, you know, you can do the exact same thing that people do for the expected Euler characteristic for, for this particular process. And I'm gonna just skip the ugly formulas, but okay. Um, so I can do the same thing I did for a single peak. Uh, I can modify, the centered Gaussian process to put down local maxima of the U process at these locations. And um, well, I can also insist that the active KKT conditions are satisfied. So yes, I mean, there's, a, there's I said I didn't want to dump notation on you, but okay. So the U process, it will be marginally Gaussian and I have to put local maxima at different a set of points. So I'm going to condition on the gradients being zero at that point. So that's what this is the Gaussian process that satisfies the equality. And I'm going to modify it by um, this, this term that is analogous to the single point palm Jacobian. And well, I'm going to now that's the exponential family. I'm just going to do inference in this model. And um, yeah, I can do the inference in that model. But, I mean, uh, okay. So now in the last few minutes, I'm going to say why. I should just say, I mean, this slip obviously is going to slip by. Here, I, I've written the, the palm theory for the process F, not the selected process. Remember, I said I'm going to use the, the randomized F to select peaks, and I'm going to do inference after that. So I, this, this term here is for if I had not done any randomization. 
And uh, so you, you don't have to randomize to actually do this. You can still do inferences, extended family without randomization, but there's the following happens for this model. If I don't randomize, actually, if you look at the, the, the law of the gradient given the field at the different points, it's degenerate because, and that's because I condition on these gradients being zero. So I have a degenerate distribution, and that means I have no information to estimate zeta. These, the gradients here is the, are the sufficient statistics for zeta, so I have no information to estimate delta under this model. So that's why I'm going to do the selecting model on the select process, rather the, which is the randomized version of F, um, rather than F itself. Again, that's going to be an exponential family, and again, I can do inference in it. And it happens that actually just simple approximate likelihood inference works quite well. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to run the Slepian model on FS, but really I want, you know, I know there's some joint distribution between the path and the select, the, the noisy version of the path. So I'm going to write a Slepian model for the joint distribution. It's again going to be an exponential family. And again, I'm just going to do inference in the exponential family. Okay, so. You can write it out. It's a bit messy notation, but um, okay. So I don't have much time left. Um, let me just say a little bit, one more, th one thing about the this likelihood approximation. So there's this normalizing constant I need to find if I want to do likelihood inference. And, you know, it's a kind of messy integral. Um, and if you want to do like, you know, you have to be able to evaluate this integral at every beta and zeta. Uh, here I, I use delta instead of zeta. Should fix that. Um, but you can actually. This is, it turns out to be. Uh, it's a you know it's a log concave function, and we can approximate the integral of a log concave function against the Gaussian by using something like Chernoff's approximation. And so I'm going to use that approximation as my as my cumulative generating function, and I'm just going to pretend that that's correct, and I'm going to use that to compute information and maximum likelihood theory. And that's actually all that we've done here. And so high level, if I have two peaks, it boils down to solving an additional, I don't know, maybe four dimensional optimization problem. So it's a, a low dimensional problem and a smooth problem. And well, I haven't exactly told you how to compute the information, but it's, it's a pretty straightforward uh, thing. Okay, so I, I should stop there because I'm out of time. Great, thanks, Kelsen. And any questions? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, in the FMR, I guess, or I guess, how do you use this method? Does it like really depend on the underlying data process to actually be like a Gaussian process? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything I've written today, yeah, these distributions are, yeah, ping dot is a Gaussian process with mean zero. Yeah. I guess yeah. I'm just curious, like, how sensitive do you think this, this would be to that assumption? And I guess, how true do you think that is in the SFRI case? Uh, so that's a fair question. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are non Gaussian processes, of course. Uh, so, in the fMRI case, I mean, there, you've done some averaging that gets you closer to Gaussian, and the measurement noise, maybe some, I mean, yeah, I don't have a I don't have a precise answer, but everything, all the p-values I showed you before also suffer from that problem. Uh, so they all start from the Gaussian. So there are some, for some simple designs, you can do permutation inference, though that's kind of, uh, it, it doesn't allow you to do peak inference, but you have to make some assumptions to say things. You know, like there's people like to say assumption-free methods, but like if you don't assume something, you actually don't really get anything. Uh, I mean, that's sort of my theory, but so yeah, it may not be Gaussian and well, you may not be able to use this method. Yeah. Well, it's univariate across like it's across in the fMRI, it's across the, the time, the time effects, or if it's a population of individuals, you might do a T test comparing two groups. So it's univariate across samples, but then you get an image of test statistics. So like this is, you know, this one is not, this isn't a univariate process. Uh, this is a one dimensional process. So like in fMRI, it's three dimensions, but we've collapsed the fourth dimension often. Um, and 
that's the sort of averaging that one hopes gets you closer to Gaussian. Can you say something about the second highest peak? Well, in, so in, 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 well, I mean, so in, in the large box limit, people there's a, you know extreme value theory for stationary things is pretty well established, and um, so so under the null, a fair amount is known about the order statistics. I don't know exactly under what kind of alternatives people have, have studied it, um, but yes, so the just yeah. Conditioning on the second highest peak being at some location is actually somewhat hard conceptually to me to do. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't really know how to say anything about it. So what you might try and do instead of taking the second highest peak is finding a single peak is sort of like equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation in a model that has a single peak with a single location in front of it. So if you have two peaks, you could try to do maximum likelihood over the two sparse model. That's going to be a search over M cross M. That's going to, you could try like, maximum likelihood for three peak, four peak. But the lasso actually, you know, it's, it doesn't have to do all that. It actually, you know, it gives me multi-peaks without doing the, you know, the intractable search. But yeah, I, I can't say anything about the second highest peak in a fixed domain, anything sensible. Anyways. You can use data splitting though. Like you can, if you don't want to recover, like reuse the information on the first half, you can do data splitting, choosing the second highest peak if, if you think that's a better selection method. Yes. So you hope, yes. Yeah. yeah, you I I didn't start with this. I, I started with we've already done the limit and it's Gaussian. So yeah. I mean someone would might me would should do that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Related to this work is the sort of the study of um, locations of mothers. It, it, I mean, that is an analog of the bump hunting. So th this would be sort of most appropriate to when you have like a small departure from a single, or like if you have a baseline density, if you take small departures from that, this is the kind of thing you might try and detect those things with. But around the theory for estimated locations of mothers is that there's this really, really hard problem of horrible action bikes that take forever to converge. And so I guess I wonder, like, could you tell us about, like, why you um, are really optimistic about the small one and using sample size performance? Well, I have no sample size actually. Like well, asymptotics have kicked in and I have Gaussian. So, like, th th there's something in these other problems, like, when to get to the limit Gaussian, you sort of collapsed over that already. And so I haven't. I haven't addressed any of that today. So I'm just talking, I've, someone has done the work to say a Gaussian approximation is suitable. How might you do in this setting? Yeah, and so, and, and these are like, kind of like local alternatives from a Gaussian limit. Like there's small perturbations from the null. Yeah. I mean, the good question is, yes, you, you'd want to know that the Gaussian approximation is okay, but I'm trying to say, well, what can you do if you know that a Gaussian approximation is okay? Yeah. Uh, so now, I mean, like harder in detection or harder like computation. I mean, I, I would say, you know, what people like. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. So it's not the traditional setup of the lasso where you have uh, like restricted isometry because you know things are correlated but actually correlations they can drop quite quickly if you have say a gaussian kernel so actually it, it, the estimation problem is probably similar to um you know as the box grows to something like the um so so the the thing that replaces p uh the number of features is like the volume of the box so you'd expect it to be something like you know maybe uh you, it's s log p over n square root is the sort of typical error for um for high dimension you, maybe it's like you might get square root s log volume over n but um in terms of how many are expected well you know this was well here there were eight uh and what people want to do with this is you know they these locations are like real locations of neuroscientists and they they know something about these regions and they want to maybe build a model so this kind of analysis is a little out of vogue but I mean, talking to some people over the past 
whatever, 10 years who are interested in neuroimaging is one is because they, they didn't really provide ways to make models. Uh, that you, we could just analyze peaks and report peaks and there wasn't a way to sensibly make models besides, oh, there was a peak here in another paper, they found a peak here. This is evidence for this theory of language. You know, I'm, I'm being facetious here. I'm not a neuroscientist, but like this, I'm trying to give them a tool where they could build models. But so I think 20 or 30 would be, you know, uh, probably reasonable. Uh, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't, these are peaks selected. I, I mean, only, I guess only three of them pass, I think the darker ones are the ones that pass the 5% family's error rate threshold. Like that's not very many peaks. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think finite number of peaks is the kind of setting, like twenty thirty, but I, I, I don't know. Okay, and then thanks again for the really very insightful talks.